let's kick off this test lab. Uh, welcome to V2, the Institute for the Unstable Media. Uh, my name is Michel van Dartel. I'm one of the curators here at V2. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to Test Lab, the graduation edition 2014. Um, if you're not familiar to this uh, Test Lab format, uh, it's basically an evening full of experimentation in artistic research and development. Um, and you, the audience, are going to be the test panel. Uh, don't worry, it's, it's all going to be voluntarily. Uh, but there will be some stuff for you uh, uh, to try out, engage with, uh, uh, experiment uh, with. Uh, but the point of the evening really is to start a conversation uh, with the people behind these works about the works that you see uh, set up around you. Uh, the evening is basically split up in two parts. The first part, we're going to walk around this space and visit each and every one of these projects that you see set up around you. Um, and in the second part of this evening, which will follow an hour and a half from now, more or less, um, that is the time for you to actually come back to these works and continue that conversation. Uh, there will be some stuff uh, introduced to you to try out, to taste, uh, to, uh, to experiment with. Uh, the, the second part of the evening is where you come back to these works and do that uh, yourself, but also have one-to-one uh, one -to -one conversation, conversations with all the people behind uh, these works. Um, so Test Lab is, uh, this Test Lab series this is a, quite a regular event that we do here at V2, is about experimentation, about new developments, new experiments in this uh, sector. Um, but of course, what is the biggest novelty in our sector is, or what causes the biggest novelty in the sector, is this new generation of artists and designers entering the field every year as they graduate from universities and academies. So we find it very important to sort of keep a close eye on what the things are that they are addressing. So what tendencies are there present in this new generation of artists and designers? Um, we're, we're going to browse through these works, but the red thread should be that we're going to look at new themes, new methodologies, new motives, etc. That's what you should, what you should uh, keep your eyes open for, because that is what, all, what this new generation will bring to, uh, to our field. Um, uh, what you see here tonight is a selection of projects, uh, but it's a selection based on many, many submissions that we actually received uh, uh, from uh, academies and universities all around Europe. Um, as we have been doing these, these uh, graduation editions uh, for quite a few years now, more and more teachers and teaching coordinators started submitting works to us to show here tonight. Uh, and I'm happy to say that this year we received around 50 submissions from, from these teachers. Uh, on the basis of which we made a small selection, which is about the maximum we can show in this space in one evening. Uh, the selection that we made is not so much the best works in that, uh, among all these submissions, but it's a selection that sort of represents these general tendencies that I was talking about before. Uh, and uh, hopefully at the, at the end we can conclude on some of those new, uh, new developments that these new artists and designers bring into our field. Um, I think uh, I would actually like to start this evening by thanking all of those teachers and teaching coordinators that have submitted works to, tonight, uh, to tonight's event, because they're not only helping us out uh, in, in terms of uh, curating a great event, they're also really uh, promoting their students and their work and their academies. Uh, I know that some of them are present here tonight, so maybe we should give them a hand first. So we narrowed it down to a selection of uh, seven works, and I'm going to give you a very quick uh, preview of what you're going to see, experience, engage with uh, tonight. Uh, right here is the work of Mohammed Ali. He's graduating from the Royal College of Art uh, on a very interesting topic uh, dealing with uh, DIY energy science uh, that we're going to dive into uh, first after this opening. Um, there's Roel Roskam Abing graduating from the Piet Swart Institute over there on DIY Wi-Fi. Uh, that we're going to have an interesting conversation uh, about. Uh, all the way in the back there is uh, Jairo uh, Gutierrez, uh, graduating from the Academy of Media Arts in Cologne, uh, who did a great intervention piece uh, that we're going to play with ourselves uh, tonight. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, all in the corner over there, Catherine Fleming, who created a speculative zoo that we're going to talk about. And it's amazing uh, how much detail there is in that work. Uh, there's Veronica Kren right here, uh, graduating on making data uh, t tasteable, I guess, right? 
<laughs> That's what, so we're, what we're going to do is taste some data. Uh, that is uh, going to be great as well. Uh, in the middle, we see a, a project by Lasse van den Bos, graduated from the Piet Zwarte Institute in Rotterdam. Uh, who is not only, there's a few gifts there, not only gifts from Google, but also gifts uh, that people gave to Google. There's an interesting narrative around that that we're going to dive into. And then behind that is a setup uh, by Peter Edwards, who graduated from the Royal Conservatory, who now have a very interesting collaboration with the Institute of STEM, uh, a, a, a master in uh, sonology. Uh, we're going to talk to him about that master, but also about some of his uh, graduation work. So, that is a lot of terrain to cover tonight. Uh, I want to remind you once again that uh, these conversations that we're going to have with these artists and designers are basically just the kickoff of this conversation. We're going to spend 10 minutes on each project, more or less, to talk, about, uh, to talk about their work and then move on. But this is an open invitation for you to, in the informal part of this evening, come back to these works, explore them more deeply, and uh, continue that conversation. Uh, a lot of terrain to cover. Uh, without further ado, I would say let's start uh, right here with uh, Mohammed, Mohammed Ali's work. Do you have sound? Can we have some sound? Okay. Um, Mohammed uh, just graduated from the Design Interactions program at the Royal College of Arts. Um, only a few weeks ago. Congratulations. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but before that, you already studied uh, fine arts in, uh, at Central St. Martin's. That's right. Uh, you were trained as a furniture maker. Yeah. Uh, and you also ha already had a career in radio and television. So before That's I actually right. introduce you uh, uh, more elaborately, what actually made you want to go back into uh, design interactions while you already had a career? Um, it was something I wanted to do because it kind of gathered together everything that I've done in the past. Um, design Interactions is quite a unique course because we're looking at, um, we're looking at uh, technology, we're looking at um, science, we're looking at, um, I guess, social implications of all these things. And it's almost within an art context as well. Um, so a lot of the projects do look like they could, uh, they do belong in a gallery, um, maybe as an art exhibition. But there is the, the context behind them where they uh, have a, a, um, kind of technological concepts or scientific ideas behind them as well. Um, and it, it, really the idea to design interactions was to tie all these um, bits of my background together and to provide a critical environment where I could really kind of get to grips with the ideas that I had myself. Great, great. Okay, let, let me continue this introduction. Um, so your work, uh, especially the work that you did at uh, RCA over the past two years, revolves around the social, economic, and political associations we, th we have with energy. That's and right. basically you're building scenarios to sort of unravel those relations. Yeah. Um, and uh, this resulted in the work that is basically around us, mm -hmm. uh, which is titled A Counterfactual Speculation. Uh, maybe you can uh, explain to our audience what this spec speculation is and also why it is counterfactual. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, the, the speculation really is, is looking at um, <clears throat> what kind of environments can we create, what kind of inf infrastructures can we create that are alternatives to what we have just now. So, um, we've got a, a referendum happening in Scotland this year, a referendum for independence, and that gives us an opportunity to kind of wor wonder what could happen with this country. It's a blank slate. It's a, it's a, it's a blank canvas. And so, w what could we do with that? Now, looking back in history, in 1979, there was another referendum. And at that time, again, Scotland would have been a blank slate after the referendum. And we know what happened in Scotland in 19, uh, from 1979. So it was really about trying to find out how we could um, create a different society with the idea that we could start in 1979 with the stuff that was going on then, and then see how we could then progress up to now and maybe in the future, um, just looking at energy and economics. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe we can dive into a few uh, uh, separate parts sure. of the project. Sure, okay. So, um, I mean, the core of this was the timeline, and I created a series of events within this timeline to try to figure out how Scotland could become a, a different kind of a country. So, since 1979, we've had uh, independence. Um, then we have um, the Sovereign Wealth Fund, which gets created. And that's the wealth that comes from um, tax revenues from North Sea oil, a bit like uh, what Norway has done with its sovereign wealth fund. Um, and that's going to be used to um, provide Scotland with an infrastructure possibly in the future. Um, maybe it needs to, uh, the money at some point for something. But then as, t as things develop, 
um, the, the, the money from the Sovereign Wealth Fund gets, gets spent. In 1984, we have um, an event which is the Energy Intellectual Property Rights Act. Now, I was looking at intellectual property rights, and, and it's, they're often a barrier to progress. And I figured, why not have, it's quite a radical step, but why not try to reverse some of these ideas of intellectual property rights? So we have um, intellectual property rights to do with technology uh, that are energy related. They, they become open access. And in 1983, we had Richard Stallman with the new um, software foundation um, creating open access, open software. And I thought, well, why, not? why don't we do this, a similar kind of thing with en energy technologies? And that then became the basis for the other different projects. So, um, so but, but maybe to, to recap. Yeah. So basically, uh, you imagine Scotland, if it had basically won the referendum of, exactly. of independence, yeah. and then uh, picture how the energy politics would have developed. That's right. right. Okay. I mean, Scotland almost did become independent. 52% of people voted yes, but there was political things going on in the background which meant that Scotland didn't actually become independent. That's just an interesting piece of history. There are other things going on as well, but that's, that's just the basis of it. Um, and so, um, as, as things develop in 85, you have the Public Energy Act, which uh, I've kind of tried to demonstrate with this model here. And around about that time, in the late 70s, early 80s, was a, a scientist from Edinburgh University called Stephen Salter. And he developed what was then called the Salter Duck. And this was a wave machine that bobbed up and down on the sea and generated energy. With the context of the intellectual property rights being repealed, um, people could then use his uh, ideas and create their own machines funded by the Scottish government's sovereign wealth fund. So this is what... The, the government poster might have looked like at the time, where people could apply for funding to create their own infrastructures. And, and so this is a, a test rig that this inventor created. Um, and you could then see how his model worked, and then maybe he made another model um, to, to actually work out how much energy was created, then goes on to make uh, further prototypes until eventually he makes um, a working piece, the, a working uh, machine that can actually generate energy. So th this is looking at it on an individual level. But I also wanted to look at it on a much larger level, um, perhaps on a community-wide level. And that's where um, this piece comes in. This is a blueprint um, for a coal mine, or a series of coal mines in this town called Loch Gelly in eastern Scotland. In the 60s, uh, the coal stopped being produced from this coal mine, and the town was largely forgotten. So I wanted just to look at how to um, use the infrastructure there, use the information people had, the, the skills and techniques, and then bring it up to date to some extent, and creating a, an infrastructure of, of geothermal heat pumps, where they could then start to generate energy from the mines themselves, rather than from coal, but from the, the physical mines themselves. The, the energy would then get taken up to the surface. You could then use it to create hot water or, or you know, to, to power new industries, for instance, um, and so on. So that was kind of what I was looking for um, in, in that context. And you could, you could perhaps speculatively apply this to other areas as well, like, for instance, oil, oil rigs. Um, I mean, they go down much deeper. You could actually perhaps generate true geothermal power from those. Um, what about old fishing fleets? Perhaps you could... Um, repurpose old fishing fleets to become energy generating machines as they bob up and down on the waves. Um, I mean, there's the other aspects, there are other things that you could do with infrastructures that already exist. So that's kind of looking at that. And also, challenging what a relationship is to energy. Could you then move to an energy area that you wanted to move to, for instance? And that then brings, to, brings about displacement of people. Rather than energy going to cities, people then go to where the energy sources are. But for so speculation, this is actually yeah. quite realistic, no? This, this is quite realistic. I mean, it, it, I'm, I think this could be possible. I mean, I haven't got this checked out by structural engineers or anything yet, but, I mean, we use geothermal heat pumps, and so this is just a, a natural extension of what, could, what we could use infrastructure for. So that's within this context. Um, on a much larger global level, I wanted to look at... Um, uh, energy infrastructures, like for instance, uh, we've we've been using nuclear energy for a while. Um, I know that the, new, the the government, if it gets uh, a referendum, would like to abandon nuclear energy, conventional nuclear energy. But really, we still need um, a, a, a source of power, a source of energy that's reliable and that is kind of sustainable to some extent. And 
Um, we've had this dream of having nuclear fusion energy for some time, and within this context, I created the Third Millennium Prize. And in the year 2000, the Scottish government creates this prize. It's a bit like the Longitude Prize of the 18th century, which the English government created in order to find out how to cross oceans safely. And somebody, John Harris, eventually came up with a clock that was accurate enough to enable people to do this. But within this context, it was about bringing together people from all around the world um, who have an interest in nuclear fusion, who want to contribute to this, and it then gets, again, funded by the Sovereign Wealth Fund. So all these things kind of um, are within the realms of possibility. It is, it is a speculation, but it's about if we have a series of events that we can perhaps then start to work out how we can then slowly shift from the economies that we've got at the moment to different forms of economies, the, the kind of politics that we've got at the moment to different forms of politics. So within all these kind of um, these frameworks, it was, I was looking at how we can then start to share energy. Now we can have um, we can conceive of peer-to-peer -peer energy networks. Um, we already have peer-to-peer -peer file sharing networks, and since about the late 90s, 99, we've had Napster, for instance, and that's been a means of sharing um, information. But if we overlay this um, information network on top of a power network then we can start to share energy. So if you've been creating energy, it's difficult to store it. So one of the sensible things to do, I guess, would be then to, to put it on this network and give it away. Because then you know that at some point, there's going to be a time when you need it, and you can get it back from the network as well. So if you're, if you're giving away energy, it starts it's something that you've created. Uh, then it starts to create this different concept of economy, a sharing economy. And that's kind of where I was going with, with all these projects. So, so it seems to me that the, the Scotland you uh, envision uh, in, this, in this model uh, is a much more sustainable Scotland, right? Very much so. So, yeah. so do you think this could also be a sort of pressure means in the upcoming referendum, this project? It, it, it could be. I mean, it's, it's something that uh, I'm not so super keen on, on having, taking a side on, on, on who whether it's going to be yes or no. But I want to present this as a model for people to look at and maybe come up with their own speculations. I mean, if the Scottish government, um, if, if Scotland did become independent and the Scottish government wanted to take this model on, great, I'd really like that to happen. I'd even move back to Scotland and live there and maybe help them with it. That would be great. But um, it, I think sometimes it, things can be too progressive, but that's fine um, as long as people can understand that you can take ideas from this develop your own ideas and then maybe take them a bit further. Okay. That's kind of what this speculation is all about. Yeah. Well, I, I know that you did a, a lot of background research to each and every one of these parts of the story, uh, but I would like to invite everyone to dive a little bit deeper into, into that with you one-on-one. -on -one. Sure. Are there any uh, urgent questions right now for Mohammed? Could you maybe say something about the model behind you? The, the reactor. Yeah. This is, this is something that, um, um, that gets uh, created in 2008 within this kind of speculation. This is after people have come together from around the world in, in, in the year 2000, or from the year 2000, and they're starting to work together to create um, this, this self-sustaining nuclear um, fusion reaction. And uh, lots of governments have been doing this across the world. They've been coming together to, to create um, fusion reactions in, in, in different forms. Um, in, in, in different locations, but for once, this is this is a place where there's a significant investment of money, significant numbers of people with the with the right ideas, with the right technological backgrounds to enable that to happen. And and one of the things that happens um, often in science, or regularly in science, is that you have innovations happening just by pure chance. Serendipity happens, and and you know, um, and a step gets taken forward. And that's what this was about. Where enough people come together, enough money is within is given is, is funding the research to, for something like this to happen. I just learned from uh, Ruhl that you actually get arrested for DIY nuclear science. Uh, so right. Okay. <laughs> maybe maybe should uh, Ruhl, maybe you should share that story later on with uh, Mohammed. Uh, we need to move on. Uh, again, uh, this is just an invitation to continue the conversation with Mohammed later on. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you. Um, we're moving on to the next graduate uh, right here. Um, and we're actually in the middle of his work. Uh, the next graduate is right next to me, Lasse van den Bos Christensen. 
you're actually a, a graphic designer, but now also a master in media design and communication. Congratulations. Sure. Um, uh, your work deals with changing modes of production, especially digital labor, crowdsourcing. Uh, and uh, that theme actually led you into a very interesting story uh, that I would like to invite you to share with our audience. Thanks. Um, yeah, basically my, my story is about uh, uh, Google and two pieces of software that they created and, uh, and uh, let people use. So one of them is Google Earth, which is this uh, virtual globe that you can explore, and it's all in 3D. Uh, you probably all know it, you browse it, and you see beautiful cities around the world. Uh, but what many people don't know is all of these cities until quite recently, until 2012, was built by humans. Uh, you don't necessarily know this because there's no actual indication that this is a, a human-made uh, model. Um, so these humans, these volunteers, uh, spent thousands of hours to build up uh, this virtual globe uh, using this uh, software, a uh, uh, 3D modeling software called SketchUp. Um, in 2012, Google decides to sell SketchUp uh, and close the, the volunteering program. Uh, so in this sense, uh, shutting down uh, the volunteers' possibility to, to actually to work and to enjoy their uh, spare time. Um, just before shutting them uh, down this platform, Google decided to, to thank some of the most productive volunteers uh, whom they addressed as uh, top modelers, which, yeah, is, yeah, I don't know if it's a joke or not. It could be. Um, but a lot of people, of course, took this very serious. And, and, and uh, this gift then consisted of, of this mug, uh, a postcard. Uh, I will read it aloud. Uh, thank you. You've proven yourself to be one of the top models in the world, contributing at least 100 models to Google Earth. Please accept this gift as a symbol of our gratitude for all your hard work. Um, and furthermore, it, yeah, there's a pencil case and some stickers and some post-it notes. Typical useful stuff. Yeah, useful stuff, um, definitely. So you had, you had these modelers uh, that were very excited about these, this gift from Google and you had them uploading images, uh, so-called selfies, to the official forums, holding up the, the mug. Um, and of, the, of course, at the same time, you have, you have a lot of people who are really frustrated because their sort of, uh, yeah, their passion and their hobby has been taken away from them. Um, so I've been trying to engage these, uh, all of, or some of these top modelers. I was writing to around 50. Uh, and, and managed to get in conversation with, uh, with 10 of them, and, and all of them were really sharing this, this story of theirs very passionately. Um, but uh, uh, Lasse, before so we go into the, into the, into the gifts uh, that you asked these people to give back to Google, um, so b to conclude uh, this part of the story, basically uh, their work was, the, all of their hard work was deleted uh, for forever. Yeah, what, what happened was that uh, Google sold the, uh, the platform to replace the content built by modelers uh, with auto-generated auto content uh, based from uh, several sources, so like satellite photos, street view photos, and so on. So in this way, you can actually manage to, to auto-generate a 3D city, uh, and you don't need the, the human worker actually anymore to, to complete it. So, uh, so basically, they were replaced by an algorithm. So the yeah the the free work has been replaced by yeah the algorithm. And, and then you uh, came up with the idea to uh, actually invite these people to express their uh, emotion to this in another gift back to Google. Yeah, yeah. This this would make it really concrete. I had a lot of conversation and it was very uh, extremely text dense. So I asked them if they would uh, give a gift back to Google. What would it then be? Um, so you got this whole array of, of, uh, of uh, gifts, one of them being a crushed cup, uh, which, uh, yeah, I'm going to read some of it aloud. Uh, it's, it's a, it's, I can tell it's a guy, but he wants to appear anonymously. Um, I started 3D modeling with Google SketchUp and found it fantastic. I spent all my spare time on this hobby, and he writes hobby in a quote. 
Um, when you announced your plan for selling, it was very frustrating. I'm still disappointed. I'm still disappointed in you. You almost got unlimited help to create a 3D representation of our world for the price of some mocks. Um, and he ends out off with, uh, by the way, I'm joking. Nobody forced me to create 3D models. Um, I guess I did just those to increase my own ego. Uh, of course, if you would hire me, I would accept. So, <laughs> so we want to keep that option open. Yeah, yeah okay. uh, and, and that's also like this uh, ambivalent feeling uh, in the modeler is really present in, 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 in a lot of the gifts that people are really uh, frustrated and sad with this decision, but at the same time, they're, they're really in awe to this, this uh, uh, big So, so their love for Google is bigger than their disappointment in this decision? It, it, it would seem so in many, in many incidences. Uh, yeah. is, is there another one that you want to highlight, another gift? Um, yeah, maybe this one, that's the last one. This is actually, I've been talking to this uh, guy for some time as well, uh, but this is a quote for, from the official forums. Uh, it says, uh, Dear Google, thanks for the gift. I might have changed the wording on it though. It could have read, I modeled over 2,000 models for Google Earth and all I got was this coffee cup. Or, I lost my primary source of income, but at least I got a cool co coffee cup out of the deal. Just kidding. Well, not really. <laughs> so also quite ambivalent. Uh, about yeah, yeah. Uh, and I actually presented this uh, this card to him afterwards, and like uh, to hear out his feelings about it. And and he was like, "No, nah, don't send this to Google. Uh, I still have a lot of. I, I have a really good relationship to to a lot of people in Google. So it's it's yeah. It's again this really ambivalence in it. Um, yeah. And, and I think the last bit is also uh, interesting because uh, he or she says, I lost my primary source of income. So some of these people were doing this professionally. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's really another level of, of this, uh, this whole mess that it actually is. Um, some people actually chose to, to model uh, not just as a hobby, but, but as a way of living. So they would offer their modeling skills to the different shop owners or to, uh, yeah, yeah, for universities, so on. Uh, and, and then to put uh, their, uh, their physical representation into the virtual representation so they, they would make free models for them. A, qu a question to the other, did anyone ever buy such a model here? No? Okay. <laughs> Just curious. Um, so um, wh what is your position in this? Uh, do you feel that these users have been exploited and then dumped? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, but I was never part of this uh, personally. Uh, I'm more actually looking on, on this, this system, but I, I definitely feel that they've, yeah, they've been exploited. Uh, but, but Google has managed to, to distance themselves from, from this act of working and turning it into something that is fun and enjoyable and that you get a present out of, uh, out of doing. So it's actually not to work, it's more play. But, but then your project uh, c could also be read as a warning sign to other user communities, right? Um, yeah, for sure. I, I think like this, you've seen this before, that, like proprietary platforms that, that collapse uh, and that people are then lost. Uh, so I, I, I think this will continue to happen because it's, it's also like this yeah, relationship there's between the user and the, the, the platform owner that is not it's not only bad that Google did this because they also made this uh, available, that they made uh, a, a hobby for people. Um, so it's really, it's really uh, not only, people have not only been exploited, but they also gained something themselves. Um, so it's not as, as, as uh, black and white as, as you could, or as you would like to cut it. Uh, are there any questions in the audience at this point? Don't be shy. <laughs> no? Uh, well, I, one I think is an obvious question, I was expecting that for you, uh, really, um, is uh, what was Google's response to this? Because obviously they have, they have found that you're working on this, right? I have not yet been contacted. No? Uh, no. no. Uh, wh yeah. What do you think their response would be? Um, yeah, first of all, of course, there's the, the copyright, copyright issue. Um, uh, yeah, uh, and I, I, yeah, I expect a really formal uh, uh, reply from them, but, but it, yeah, I don't know. It, it's hard to say what they would think. It's, it's a bit of a, a big, ambiguous organization that you cannot really uh, penetrate. Yeah, uh, 
I actually have to say, uh, I, I, I think I heard first about this project already a, a few months ago. And every time when I'm now being that user online, I feel sort of, I, I think of your project and I feel this sort of warning in myself, like, you're doing it right now. Do you also have that? Do you also? Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I, I have a Gmail account, uh, uh, so on. So we're all, So, so yeah. how can we armor ourselves to that? Yeah, I, that's that's really hard to to give a definite uh, answer answer to this. Uh, of course, like it's always good to look into alternatives, uh, like alternatives to to these uh, big services that are highly designed and easily accessible, uh, and then to look into to other platforms that that might not be as easy, uh, but but offers um, yeah yeah. Um, not these, uh, yeah, these issues of, of actually being sold or actually you losing your rights to, to, to your property. So we should just be very conscious of it. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, if there's no further questions, one last scan. No? Then thank you, Lasse, for the introduction of your project. Uh, a big applause, please. Um, also here, uh, please uh, revisit uh, Lasse and his project here later on because there's actually a, a, an interesting and funny story behind each and every one of these presents and also some of the discussions that he had diving into this, uh, diving into these uh, discussions as a sort of embedded journalist uh, also, are also very interesting. But you, do you have any documentation with you here or can we find it somewhere? Um, I have a couple of uh, theses with me, uh, so for interested, I have it here, uh, and of course, I can also uh, uh, give out a link. Okay. I have it online. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to the next uh, project right here. Thank you. Um, on the on the side note, uh, it's pretty warm in here. If you're getting thirsty, there's uh, some fresh water on the bar for you uh, to take if you're uh, getting dehydrated. Um, next to me is Veronica Kren, uh, who graduated from the Interface Culture Program of the University of Arts and Design in Linz uh, on the basis of her work, uh, which is basically all around me right now. It's an exploration into using food as a communication tool for cultural data. Am I saying that correctly? Yes. Yeah? Um, uh, maybe you can start by telling us how data tastes. Well, that's always depending on the data. Uh, sometimes super disgusting and sometimes very way more delicious than the original recipe but this is really depending we also like it depends how much modi modification it's depending on what the percentage is and like dealing around with how much modification I can put into that it's super disgusting or what is happening when there is more unemployment or less unemployment it's getting sweeter or yes so, so you're, you're talking about employment is that one of the statistics the data sets that you use? Um, that was this one thing we did for these um, super delicious cakes. I don't know if you know all this, that's the Linzer Torte. It's like a super traditional cake in, for Linz. And here we were talking about the topic of uh, women's and how they're living, how is the living situation in Linz, because like, it's still like baking is more or less a, a women's task. And like each ingredient of this cake is like modifi modified by one other da data set. So we are actually looking at, a, as, at the big picture of this topic and each cake is representing one year. Yes, and not always the ones which look good are taste good. Which, uh, which is the tastiest one of, this, uh, of these ones, um, you know? When we did the kind of tastification with people, it actually turned out that the last years, 2010 and 11, are the most delicious ones. And why is that? Because, because of which balance in ingredients? I think it was the unemployment. But I think so it's more the combination <laughs> of this entire... unemployment is good for your cakes. <laughs> it turns out, okay. Well, at well. least there's something positive to say for unemployment. Uh, do you want to go through all the projects or uh, you want to get tasting? Hmm? Well, maybe do one more. Uh, I think the sausages one uh, looks interesting. Can you um, tell us about that one? The sausage it was a little bit a different approach because like it's just using one data set is the corruption perception index from uh, yeah and like all like there were four sausages made like every one person is representing their own country and we 
basically had a look on meat scandals in those country, countries and mixed then this, what they found in the sausages into it according to the percentage of the, of the index. Yes, I have to say, they were all disgusting. <laughs> like, Will you survive? Yes, <laughs> I'm here. Um, okay, now, now let's, let's, uh, let's uh, do some tasting. Uh, maybe you should first explain what's happening here and then one of you has to volunteer. Can we already point out a volunteer? Yeah, you're hungry? Okay. <laughs> oh, there's two volunteers, okay. Applause for the volunteers. <laughs> Okay, um, maybe first explain uh, to what we're, uh, actually this is the right order. First point out the volunteer, then explain what they have to taste. Okay, go ahead. Um, for us it's always really important that we have this traditional aspect that we know how a specific food tastes. So for this show we said we are going to reinvent the patats besau. According <laughs> to the statistic of how many eight, uh, a about the biggest ethnic groups in Rotterdam. Uh, we changed the, um, the curry ketchup, um, modifi modified it with uh, traditional ingredients from those countries, and then with the percentage, seeing, uh, mixing it together with the ketchup. Okay. And, and, uh, and what, what kind of ingredients should I think of in terms of, uh, I, see, I see, well, for instance, what is the ingredient in the, in the Dutch one? I think you should taste it. <laughs> Later on. <laughs> so how do I taste this? Uh, with, uh, with some fries? Well, how, how you eat patates special with mayonnaise and onions, they are the original one, the patates as well. Does, it, and does you actually uh, everyone know what a patate special is? But the, yeah, okay, good. Okay. Um, now you are the volunteer. Oh my, <laughs> I think we, we made a different deal before the show. <laughs> If I can't speak anymore after this, someone else needs to moderate. <laughs> well, it, is, pure, is it pure tomato? No, it's not, because it's actually, what we found out, the, there's not so much tradition for the Netherlands. The most traditional stuff is potato. So you're ah. eating potato with... Well, that's potato. so normal to me that I don't taste that. Uh, the volunteers? Uh, Anna, Peter? Um, but, but can they choose which one they taste, or should they taste them all, or...? As they wish. Okay. The fries are really good, uh, by the way. They're bramladage, uh, to get you excited. <laughs> yeah, you, uh, I think... Normally, yes, but as you like. <laughs> but the idea is that you actually uh, make a patate special, but the, the proof of it is in the ketchup, right? Yes. Okay. It's good. <laughs> you had the Suriname one. Yeah. Oh, it's, it, what does it taste like? Uh, it tastes good. I don't know what I'm supposed to. G good is good. Good is good. <laughs> Which one did you have? Serbs. Serbian uh, ketchup. And what does it taste like? don't have any clue. <laughs> uh, maybe you can enlighten us? The Serbian, we, we mix it together or actually with already ready sauce, it's the Aiva, which is super traditional for there. Uh, the, what, what is the Surinamese? The mango chutney. The mango chutney. Uh, and then the amount of it is determined by uh, how many, uh, by the percentage in the Rotterdam yes. community? Okay. So, sorry, can you repeat that? <laughs> Depends also on the percentage of Moroccans who live in Rotterdam. So in some of the, the curry ketchup, you actually don't taste so much because there are just not so many people living. Okay, so the intensity is dependent on the on the uh, percentage here. Yeah. Okay, a lot of Turkish people. Uh, okay, everyone's welcome to come back later on and taste for yourself. You can also just snack some fries with some great ketchup. Um, and what is this project about? Or uh, which data is it uh, allowing us to taste? Um, it's actually a continuation of uh, what we did like two months ago. It's like we. 
we were quite interesting, like how is actually the, the living standards and the attitude of people related to artistic fields. And since we, it's super hard for finding this data, we started to do our own survey. Uh, so actually we'd like to ask you all guys to fill out our survey that we can add it to our database. And what we are doing, we are asking is about it, the income. Is it anonymous? Yes, of course. Um, yeah, and we said we are going to do it in a cocktail. So we all, we are going to serve later on cocktails like a pina colada. Because we, for us, like for me, if you have like no money at all, you maybe end up drinking. And so the, if you the have level too much. Of, so the level of alcohol in this pina colada is determined by income, income data. Uh, this case, yes. Yeah, but uh, so when uh, maybe we should just get a volunteer and and try a cocktail. Uh, it can't be hard to find a volunteer for that, right? Yeah, okay, I thought so. <laughs> so what actually goes in a pina colada? I have no idea. Pineapple juice. Pineapple juice. Coconut syrup is coconut milk. Um, what else? Uh, rum, that's cream rum. and white rum. And the white rum is determined on the basis of? <laughs> and, and how do you now determine the amount of white rum? I have my piece of paper here. <laughs> uh, okay, there's a, there's a paper here which says, uh, can I say that? Or is it? Um, oh, not yet? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So what I'm drinking actually is just the... Well, what I'm drinking is the... I didn't get what I'm drinking. Uh, yeah, I'm also wondering, <laughs> what is he going to drink? Uh, delicious pina colada according um, to the um, living standard from artistic people. And where? <laughs> it's, uh, we are quite international. Uh, database right we, now. We, we did this in a we did this in a, in a festival in Linz where there were a lot of uh, international artists and we asked them questions like how much is your income uh, how do you make your living is it uh, jobs collected to art and um, are you positive about the future um, so according to these answers we then mapped it to the to the proportion of the pina colada. So we say, okay, when you're earning too less and you have problems with money, you, you tend to drink more alcohol. And when you're earning too much, you might also get into trouble, like because you have too much. So there is also a, a golden middle where you get also cocktails without alcohol, but that's actually random. So the visitors who get cocktails, they they are getting. Uh, they're getting it randomly, depends on the uh, person's answer, so you, you don't know if you get alcohol or not. Did, does mm. your have some? Yeah, there's a bit of alcohol, it tastes good actually. So, so uh, uh, each, how, much, uh, how much is the income on, the, each, on that uh, paper? Each uh, cocktail gets, gets a hint, so once you drink a bit, you can also try and yeah, see. It's uh, living attitude neutral, monthly income uh, 15 to 20 hundred, perceived standard of living median. Yeah, so a, yeah, you have a very average pina colada right now. <laughs> okay, we need, to, we need to really wrap this up and go to the next uh, uh, project. Uh, is there one question in the audience for now? Oh, there's a question over there. Can we have a microphone? Uh, can you? Yeah. Um, what I was wondering, um, how do you think that people um, perceive the data different than when they see it visual? Like what would be a benefit or what would be uh, very different for them to, to take the information in? Like compared to a visual representation of data, um, what benefit has this way? Yeah, so, so, so does it add anything to the interpretation of the data, I guess, yeah. right? Uh, is, this a, is this a good way to uh, represent data? So it's, oh. Yeah. Uh, well, we are still, we see all this series as like the first tries out because um, they are all experiments, and of course, that's we the first project we found out that there's the threshold is quite low, and we have to go more. 
Yeah, um, well, actually, we, we believe in the intelligence of the body and also of the other senses, because what we perceive usually, it's like more than 90%, you get the information visually, but it's not actually, um, we kind of neglect the other senses. So we said, okay, let's see what our tongue and what our mouth would say about this data. So it's, it's we, are, we are really like trusting our bodies in, in, another, in another way, not only just perceiving it visually, as we are all used to. So it's actually a, a, a literal translation of the pie chart, right? In the case of the yeah? Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, a big applause, please. <laughs> um, and uh, I, have to, I have a slightly disappointing announcement to make, which is that I asked Veronica to uh, save the cocktail tasting for later, so that I know you're not just going to hang around here, but follow me to the next project. Uh, as soon as we, uh, we've visited every project, the cocktail bar will be opened, and I'll announce this to you. Uh, the next project, uh, we're going to move over here to these great-looking animals. And next to me is uh, Catherine Fleming, Hi. Uh, uh, who also graduated from the Royal College Design Interaction uh, Program only a few weeks ago. Also, congratulations. Um, uh, you're working on themes related to natural natural history and zoology. Um, but actually, before you uh, entered the, the design interactions program, you already had a, had a career as a, as a footwear designer? Yeah. Yeah? So I, I asked Mohammed already what, what made him actually go uh, back into this program, design interactions. What, what is your motivation to actually jump out of your running career and, and move to design interactions? Um, I guess I'm not that interested in participating in disposable design. Um, which is a lot of what ends up getting produced. Um, I think that's probably why I ended up gravitating towards more biological design, things that can continue living, have a natural life cycle. Um, so yeah, I think that's... Okay, so you, basically uh, this allows you to create the space to dive deeper into that. Yeah, definitely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so, and then at the RCA, you sort of dived into the, uh, the craft of taxidermy? And had a, a, a lot of conversations with uh, zoologists, animal enthusiasts, circus historians, private zookeepers. I didn't know that those existed, but okay. Uh, and this, uh, these conversations led up to this project that we're looking at now, Endless Species, Endless Forms. Uh, can you maybe start by, by telling us a little bit on these, on these conversations you had with these people? Sure. Um, well, I guess, you know, it's really interesting sort of thinking about zoos because there's something that sort of has become very popularized within the last century, that's sort of a post-Darwinian phenomenon. Um, we have the ability to understand species at a global level. We're able to look at them and compare them anatomically, considering like how they evolved, and even the fact that species did evolve, um, that evolution existed and is still continuing. Uh, so with a lot of these, um, zookeepers, they have a lot of like very specialized information and knowledge about um, the creatures that they take care of and that they um, house. Uh, but it always sort of struck me as a strange thing, just having creatures in captivity, uh, the institution of captivity, um, and sort of how we as people want to perceive wilderness, like wild somehow, um, and how we're increasingly not able to do that on a daily basis. So we've relegated these places where we can go and we can experience animals. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I actually also have that feeling when I enter a zoo, I'm on the one hand excited to see the animals, on the other hand I'm kind of sad that there's all these animals in captivity. But uh, is that also what your project is about? Yes. Um, so. Basically, this is Regent's Park of Evolutionary Development, um, which is sort of a move on from um, Darwin's theory of evolution, thinking about the fact that, like, as human beings, we are sort of guiding the future evolution of, of wilderness, of nature, of the planet. Um, and so, truly, like, what type of wildlife and animals and plants continue to exist and don't go extinct is largely contingent upon what we want and what we think is nice, what we find interesting. Um, what we want to continue to experience. Animals like the polar bear, for example, you know, are very charismatic um, creatures, and so they've become conservation-reliant, which means that 
if we didn't conserve them and keep them as a species on the planet, they would go extinct. Um, so each one of these creatures that I developed within, within this park, which is sort of supposed to be thinking about how, you know, there are these institutions such as zoos and circuses and safaris, um, safari parks, where you can go and you can encounter wilderness, um, but how could, how could a new institution evolve from the old? Um, and I wanted to look specifically at how we could encounter wilderness in cities. So I imagined that uh, the London Zoo expanded to take over all of Regent's Park. Um, and within Regent's Park, uh, there would be sort of a future wilderness that's a designed wilderness. It's been curated by people. Um, also safe for people to, to wander through, so it's sort of like a safari park. Um, their animals are not in cages. And each one of the creatures is evolved um, by looking at adaptations that already exist within nature, um, sort of recombining them so that we can continue to experience like the encounter of, of these types of um, animals but it's sort of a condensed version in a way. Like this is, um, this is an herbivore. So I looked at a lot of like consumer resource systems and that's how I worked out what type of animals I was gonna design. So the herbivore is primarily a plant eater and um, this here is the retro reflective carnivore and it is a carnivore. Um, so the two of them have to live in balance within the park. Uh, the retro reflective carnivore lives on an island, and so it is safe for people to be in the park, but every so often the carnivore gets released into the park and can hunt the superbivore. So their population numbers are in proportion to each other, the way that they would be in like a natural ecosystem. Um, but specifically with the, the super herbivore, I took, looked at adaptations that already exist within herbivores. Am I going too long about this? No, 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 okay. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, one distinctive feature of herbivores is that they have cranial appendages, which are sort of these bone structures that grow out of their heads, and they are categorized in four different types. So there's antlers, there's horns, there's pronghorns, and then there's ossicones. So ossicones basically only exist in giraffes. Um, they're the only species that's still alive that has them. Um, pronghorns, there's the pronghorn antelope, and then there's lots of other animals that have antlers and horns. So I sort of created this hybrid horn antler Oscone pronghorn form. Um, uh, and what, adv uh, what advantage does it, does it have to have this hybrid? Basically, we're able to experience like all four at once. Ah, okay, <laughs> so it's, it's all for our viewing pleasure. Yeah, ah. it's all for human pleasure. Um, <laughs> this, so it's sort of, this animal is, um, has like the neck of a giraffe, so it can like reach its horns up into the treetops. Um, it can harvest these fruits, sort of like a fruit harvester would, and um, grab them with the, with the antler parts, and then it swirls down the horn parts and lands in the um, sort of cup above its head, and that's how it feeds itself. But in order to reach the fruit, it has to walk on this tightrope, which it can do because goats have incredible balance. Goats can actually walk on tightropes, they can hang out in trees, they can do all sorts of amazing things. So these are things that already exist within nature, but I'm sort of recombining them almost to make a safari circus. Um, so you're not, you're not gonna be walking by these animals and they're not gonna be sitting in cages. They're gonna be performing their daily activities, which satisfy their emotional needs as well as their physical needs, um, but also provide us with entertainment. So, so how did you actually research this, what people want to see in a zoo and in an animal? Um, I mean, basically looking at, at animals that are, are conservation reliant and, and animals that, that people, I mean, kind of it came down to my personal taste, to be totally honest. Um, I was really inspired by giraffes here, because I think giraffes are exceptional creatures. They're the largest, you know, mammals on earth. They have incredibly long necks, so I wanted to include that. I also wanted it to have, you know, this goat-like balance. Um, and you know the horns, so it sort of all came together. I was able to obtain um, deer skins, so that was sort of some of it was also what was available to me. Um, but yeah, 
So uh, one, one thing I'm trying to sort of find out in this conversation with you is, so is this project critical of zoos or is it actually, uh, is, uh, is, it, is it sort of a picture of what zoos could be and how great they could be? I think it's both. Um, I mean, I think that zoos are wonderful. I have a lot of really great memories of being in zoos as a child. Um, I still really enjoy going to the zoos. I love to see animals. Um, I think that there is something within people, humans, that we crave this interaction with animals. They're sort of the ultimate other. Um, and, but I just think that they're, like considering technology, um, like ways that we have of artificially selecting, you know, synthetic biology, new, new emerging technologies, we could create something that could be sort of these beautiful freaks of nature. Um, yeah, why, look at, why look at these boring normal giraffes when you can have this? Well, I mean... <laughs> wait, I, I, I want to hear a little bit more about this uh, fluffy creature here. But first, uh, I want to know if there's any questions. No questions at this point? Th then maybe, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about him? Yeah. Her? Um, yeah, gender neutral. Um, basically, this creature is created from two Arctic fox skins. Um, and I was really interested in looking at uh, basically predator-prey relationships. So usually when like a, a carnivore hunts its prey, it does so through stealth and surprise. Um, but in this case, I wanted to sort of turn that on its head and have the hunt become a very like unavoidable visual spectacle that the superbivore knows is coming but sort of can't, can't even avoid. Um, so that's why it's white. Um, it's very conspicuous. It lives on a black island. You can see it all the time. Um, yeah, that's a bit of that. Does it bite? Oh, yeah. Okay. So take a keep, dis keep safe distance. Yeah. Um, is there any other question in the audience right now? Oh, there's one over here. Uh, do we have a microphone on this side? Oh, uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, I would like to know, because you were mentioning before about uh, biological technologies of actually making these things real. And I'm interested if you have thought already about approaching scientists or labs to actually realize this. I mean, I think that there's, there are definitely artists out there who are pursuing that type of um, course. I mean, I don't know how many of you are aware of the, uh, the bioluminescent rabbit that was created. I was, um, I was thinking of that as well first, but I think that's a different approach because those um, artists have been working mostly on a, doing that as a kind of critique or as a kind of hacking. And I think you're more about like really creating or really shaping those animals in a different way. I think you could call this hacking, no? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's sort of thinking about recombinations of um, adaptations and within different species. I mean, as we're able to share more and more information, especially our vital information, our genetic information, um, we're gonna be able to create life. I mean, we're already doing it. Every apple that you eat is an apple that's been cultivated for probably a couple hundred years. Um, you know, it's not something that I think that we have to contemplate in terms of, well, are we going to pursue this? It's more, this is already underway. What form, what shape is it going to take? So, so you're also sort of amplifying this to have that discussion then? Definitely, okay. definitely. I'm not saying I want these creatures to exist, um, but I think it's something that we should think about. Like, how are we evolving nature to serve us? Can we also evolve it to serve them? Mm -hmm. Can it serve both? Yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting uh, discussion. Uh, that, uh, um, there was a, there's actually a third animal that you designed, right? Um, it's a beaked mammal, which is a type of, you know, adaptation that also exists within nature that seems wrong. I mean, the great thing about nature is there's so many adaptations that exist that if you sort of think of it, it probably has already been created. Um, so the, the ecosystem that's missing is um, one that exists between insectivores and the ants that they farm. Um, and they live in sort of a garden that's created through their mutual symbiotic relationship. Yeah. And, so, and so your plan for the zoo is also split in these three uh, regions, right? As of right now, the zoo has a lot of space. Okay. So there could be more things to come. Okay. Uh, I, I invite all of you actually to uh, speak to uh, Catherine uh, later on because the, uh, 
actually she has a whole plan for this zoo underlying uh, we've, we've just been highlighting a few animals in that zoo uh, but there's a whole plan for that whole speculative zoo that uh, I think you guys would love to dive into uh, thank you Catherine thank you. an applause please um, we're just gonna take two steps uh, to this project over here uh, which is the work of Peter Edwards uh, aka Casper Electronics which is a name that you might have uh, heard of in the, in the scene uh, he's been exploring uh, the field of circuit bending experimental music electronics for quite a few years um, and uh, then dived into the into a new master uh, at the Institute of Sonology in The Hague which is a collaboration which I find very interesting with the Institute of Stein uh, in Amsterdam um, your background is actually in sculpture, right? Yes. And, um, and uh, actually before you did that master, you already set up a, a whole department on uh, creative electronics at Hampshire College. Uh, you run uh, your website, Casper Electronics, where you sell uh, many of your interfaces. Uh, you perform all over the world. You give workshops all over the world. Uh, did you really need this master? <laughs> well, I mean, it wasn't a question of needing it. Um, it's, uh, I mean, I wasn't really going for the, for the paper. Um, I mean, I think being an artist in the, the new millennium, uh, we're in this really absurdly luxurious position of uh, deciding. The, the I like the crackling, the, 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 the it's crackle, nice. The crackle, by the way, are uh, um, ice creams that Anna Mercedes is handing out. The last out. show <laughs> I played, I, I made everyone eat ice cream during it, so this is a nice uh, continuation. continuation of that, yeah. Um, yeah, I think this is, uh, from now on when I talk, I want everyone to be eating a uh, popsicle. Uh, can I get one of those popsicles? Is that possible? Yeah, but, uh, but you yeah. can't talk with your mouth full, so... I won't, I won't. <laughs> I'm just going to hold it. Um, so let, let's no, okay, but uh, to finish off that thought, we're in a really luxurious position of being able to decide what the hell we want to do. I mean, everything, it's really, it's so arbitrary, and, and uh, we can stack bricks on top of each other, or paint dogs, or draw ourselves inside out. We can do whatever the heck we want. And that le that's really daunting. So I wanted to go back and just say, what do I actually really want to do? And spend a few years focusing on that. Because when you're in the field and you're showing and you're working and you're selling, you're really driven by that. Because it has its own momentum and that takes you somewhere. And, and I wanted to stop and say, where do I really want to go? And luckily it's where I was. So, yeah, hurrah. And it seems that a collaboration between the Institute of Sonology in The Hague and uh, the Institute of Steim in Amsterdam is a perfect combination for you then. Yep. But what does uh, this combination actually entail? Like, how, how do they work together in this master? Um, well, what... So Steim has been around for, what is it, 50 years, I think? Um, I, I don't know the exact dates, but... Um, and they really pioneered uh, the, the combination of late-breaking technologies most often with electronics and the, the musical interface, so the physical musical interface. So not as much on the software end as, it, as on the hardware and potentially the software as well. But the real focus in the end is on making music, on physically, ma you know, physically making music. And the Institute of Sonology is more focused on the science, the, the physics of electroacoustics and how sound works, with again some focus on actually making music at the end of the day. So the com combination of the two is saying let's make things but let's also think about what we're making and then make something with what we're making, if that makes sense. Yeah. So let's make the objects and the music and think about the science and philosophy behind it. So it's a nice trinity. That yeah, it's I, a, I also find it interesting because V2 has good relationships with the both, uh, uh, but that's a different story. Let's dive into your project uh, here. Um, uh, do you want to sit down or, or uh, yeah, okay, yeah, hold on to the ice cream. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, uh, but before we demonstrate some of your interfaces, can you tell us a bit of uh, about the starting point or the more conceptual part of the work? Um, yeah, so what I was writing about um, and yeah, researching over the two years uh, was sort of the nature of electricity um, and how it functions as a, a, an organic phenomenon. Um, so not as much in how do we make TVs work or how do we make better radio communication, but you know, what is this phenomena and how can it incorporate into my creative endeavors? And so there's a scientific research, but then also there on the other side, there's just completely personal, I like music, I like making music, so that's where it's grounded. So I'm doing a sort of scientific research, but within something that's completely about me and my own preference. So these instruments that I've been working on are about uh, what I would call my thesis, collaborating with circuits. Um, and um, 
and that was really about being inspired by electricity and having it sort of affect your goals and then imposing your own goals on as well because we usually think about it as a tool. So this is something, these instruments are something that I'm collaborating with, okay. not just controlling. Okay. Um, and, and, and can you give us a bit of a sample? Uh, mm. Yeah, I mean, none of these... A taster, Veronica would say. Sorry, if that was my fault. Um. So, to to call this music is a bit of an interpret uh, personal interpretation, but um, the way that this is behaving right now is in part due to what I've set the controls to do, and in part due to how electricity works. And what I'm utilizing mostly is a lot of different kinds of feedback networks, which I can explain one on one in more detail. Um, but it's basically the, the natural behavior compounding with other aspect, you know, other arms of the monster that the circuit has become. And uh, you know, I'm going to give, a, I guess, a more formal uh, performance in a bit. Um, and then I'm not really going to demo this one, but this is uh, another project which is more focused on. Uh, giving people tools to begin exploring the behavior of electricity and inventing their own instruments. So that's a big part of what I'm doing, um, is empowering people to enjoy the experience of invention. Um, so. Okay. Uh, uh, um, that was only one interface, right? That we that we heard. Yeah, but so but there's, there's a few more, and there's also a screen there. Well, yeah, there's also a screen. This is one that's been more of a personal development interface. So this is there's more to the story of this of the synthesizer. It's not only an instrument that I has specific behavior, but it's also an interface that allows me to develop as I'm going, which is a really difficult thing as a designer, is to make something that is made and it's done and it's playable, but it can also expand, and that's a really tough. The idea to, to, li to leave it where it is, or no, 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 no. Well, it's tough to leave it where it is, of course. Which is why it's the other difficult challenge I'm facing is how do I make an instrument that can continue to expand? Okay. Okay. Uh, and then there's a light component, which I could talk a lot more about, but I won't. But um, I'll address it really briefly, um, which is that this circuit, as it makes sound, that's. That's a modulation of electricity, of, of electrical levels. Um, it's the flow of electrons. When those are applied to an LED, the LED lights up. So I'm taking that thing that is the sound, that is making sound when it goes to a speaker, I'm also making it make light. But through an interesting discovery, when you take this light and you put it into a digital camera, it introduces aliasing and all these other digital, uh, it, it introduces, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? incremental, uh, uh, an external clock. Anyway, I, I won't explain aliasing, but, um, but you end up with this bizarre effect. So it's the natural behavior of analog electronics with the natural behavior of digital electronics gives you this unusual product that, that's coming out of the two of them. That's, that's embodying discovery for me. So I'm making these instruments and then I'm able to discover these new weird things that come out and determine if they're artistically useful, which over time I've determined that this is artistically useful. So how there it is. How do you determine that? Um, that's a good question. Um, well, and that's, no, it's a really good question actually because I think we can get really seduced by concept and we can say, oh, this concept's really sexy and it's relevant and it's political or whatever it is. But what it really has to be is a physical thing that you experience over time. So eventually, as a practicing musician, you're not always engaging your, your thinking brain. Sometimes it's more the like lower level where it's just automatic response. And over time that I've been performing with lights, I've found it to actually be a real integral part of my performance. And without it, it doesn't make as much sense. So it's just, it's worked its way in in a, uh, in a way that doesn't, that can't be explained certain, in a certain sense. But I guess it also introduces a level of unpredictability in, in the system, right? The, the light in the, in the camera sensor. Uh, I mean, there's, there's some intuitive things, there's some unintuitive things, there's some things we can't understand about it, but there is an inherent connection to the system, and it's based on an organic system. It's analog electronics is an organic 
uh, the, it's the embodiment of an organic phenomena. So there is something that we understand because it comes from the same place that we do, and that's where it gets more metaphysical, but it goes there in a lot, and is, a lot of ways. Is your goal much more this instrument and, and what comes out of it, or trying to understand what's happening in that system? Uh, you have to do both. I mean, I think that I, I really advocate that people learn how electronics works, but also that they embrace what they don't understand about it. And that's a weird thing to do, but that's where I think you really get something wonderful. Okay, we're going to hear what comes out of that uh, later on, as you're going to perform uh, for us uh, after we round up this uh, round of presentation. Uh, before that time, are there any urgent questions to Peter? Something you definitely want to know before he starts performing? <laughs> no? Okay. Well, then as I propose that we just continue our round and uh, invite everyone back to your performance uh, right after we wrap up the presentation. Yeah? And then uh, if there's questions coming out of that, of course, they know where to reach. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we're going to continue to uh, this side of the space. Sometimes I feel a little bit like a tour guide when I do this. Uh, I should have a pink umbrella or something. Um, next to me is uh, Roel Roskam Abing, uh, and uh, his bio is kind of funny. It simply says that he spends too much time behind his computer. Um, I think that's time well spent if it results in a master from the Piet Swart Institute. Uh, but also it's kind of logical if you uh, look at uh, the things that you're doing in your practice, uh, researching the Internet's infrastructure, and especially looking at uh, wireless uh, communities and uh, DIY techniques in relation to that. Um, uh, before we dive into your project uh, here, um, uh, most people, including me, actually take the Internet's infrastructure as a, as a given. Uh, but you seem to be sort of compelled to, to actually dive into that and understand why it is how it is. Uh, what is that drive? or What, is, what interests you there? Um, y yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, um, when I started the Pete Swart, I... I really had this question, no? like, what, what, what is the internet? And I couldn't really find an explanation for it. And There's no answer to what is the internet? There is, there is, for sure. The, the, the shortest one is that it's a network of networks, which is maybe even more confusing than the word internet. But, um, yeah, what, what, what really fascinates me is this, this idea about it, that it's, it's, uh, it has an infrastructure, no? it has a physical uh, space. Uh, and one that we use, and I might even even guess that you know we've probably traveled more through this infrastructure than we've traveled along road infrastructures. Um, so it's something we use uh, um, increasingly, um, even when we're not actively using it. No, like we all have, or a lot of us have smartphones in their pockets, which are probably you know dialing up now and sending uh, and communicating. So if there's something that we're so increasingly reliant upon, I, I just really felt compelled as well to understand it uh, in, in, yeah, in the broadest sense, I guess. Because do you feel that in, in general there's a lack of understanding of, of the internet? Uh, yeah, probably, yeah. But, yeah. Okay. And, and, that, and that sort of, uh, that interest sort of pulled you into looking at all kinds of DIY uh, solutions. Uh, do, do you want to talk about the project overall or dive into some examples that we see here? I, I could talk about the project overall first. That's, that's maybe, um, yeah, because when, when I started looking into this question, like, yeah, what, what is the internet? Uh, you find out it's like this whole bunch of cables that spans the earth. Um, uh, and they have been spanning the earth since the 19th century, you know, so it's, and it, it's, it's, been these, it's been these massive sort of undertakings by states and uh, large companies to, to build this incredibly complex network. And um, so there, there's, there's a feeling of powerlessness there as well, you know, when you, like, uh, well it's a given. There is internet, that's, or there is not, no? Um, or, or it doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, while I was doing that, at some point I stumbled while spending too much time at my computer on this phenomenon of people who actually uh, decide to build the, the, their infrastructure, their internet infrastructure for themselves. And this from the start on, it's completely fascinated me, this idea. Um, and 
Yeah, actually, it's, it's, it's funny to hear uh, uh, Mohammed Ali's project where he starts off with uh, a sort of deregulation as something that can kick off uh, no, a, a whole movement, a whole movement of autonomy uh, or the search for it. Um, because that's actually also the story of Wi-Fi. And um, Wi-Fi um, started in the uh, end of the 90s, and it actually started with a, a deregulation of the radio spectrum. So the, the telecoms regulator said, like, ah, we're going to have one spectrum of the radio, which is free for anybody to use. So you can make your uh, devices with that, uh, uh, and you don't need any licensing or whatsoever. Um, so um, from, from this given, um, uh, Wi-Fi was invented. And um, from the start, it was really designed as a sort of uh, 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 an indoor technology. So Wi-Fi was meant to have a really limited range um, uh, and uh, Wi-Fi products, because it's also an official trademark, actually. There's a Wi-Fi standard. Um, they, they can only uh, transmit with a, a very small amount of power, and they can only use very small antennas. So like the Wi-Fi has a very clear concept behind it. It should be like um, small and local. Um, but at the same time, uh, for the first time it, uh, in history, it was uh, a technology that allowed people to, to make uh, you know, digital telecommunications infrastructures because you can connect two or more computers to the same uh, Wi-Fi spot. And yeah, this, 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 this triggered um, basically a wave of uh, thinking about like, yeah, what does it mean to make an infrastructure? Uh -huh. uh, you have a question? <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I'm listening, I'm fascinated. Uh, yeah, so... Um, I, I'm just wondering how it translates to these, uh, to these objects. Then. Yes, yes, I was getting there now. Um, so it basically started um, with, with radio amateurs who have been like working uh, with radio uh, since, since it was there and who knew a lot about uh, the, this whole uh, issue with licensing of the spectrum, etc. So when it got uh, deregulated, like they were the first ones to notice, like, ah, wow, there's actually something cool here. So, so Wi-Fi actually originated from radio enthusiasts? Is, uh, is it no, 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 no. no. It, okay. it, it, it actually originates from uh, universities and companies like okay. researching new technologies. No, but they were the first ones to sort of see the novelty of having a deregulated spectrum. Yeah. Okay. Because nobody thinks about spectrum regulation ever. Okay, okay. <laughs> Obviously. Um, so they, they started sort of making, you know, sharing the internet. It's also, it's, it's just sort of the, the beginning of the 2000s, end of 90s, so internet is slow, and these people um, share their connections with each other, you know, like, uh, um, and sort of this, this idea spreads into, um, into, yeah, the idea of the wireless community network, like, hey, I have internet, I, and with this technology, I can share it with you, and with you, and with you. And uh, through this, uh, I can give you all free internet. And later, this really became a, a sort of issue about autonomy, and um, you know, like we want our own infrastructure. Um, which is all nice, but Wi-Fi was designed with such a limited range in mind. So that means that actually, if you're far away, I cannot actually share it with you. And this is where the radio amateurs sort of um, took their knowledge of of antennas and started devising ways in which you could actually um, push Wi-Fi beyond its intended use. So you could make like long-range connections. And, and, and that's what these these objects do. They and make long-range connections. Yes, and these okay. this is what these objects do. Um, and they're basically um, yeah, I I really found them fascinating because they're 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 a mix of of three things. Um, one is sort of the, the the physical properties of the of the Wi-Fi radio wave which has a, a specific size, uh, which is around 12.3 centimeters, so it's like, like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's a mix of the size of the radio wave, it's a mix of stuff that's, that lies around with which you can manipulate it, and it's also sort of, uh, at the same time, the intention to you know, push this technology to uh -huh. its limit and to appropriate it. Yeah. So, so uh, let, let's, let's uh, pick out some objects. Um, uh, let's, I think this one looks very funky. Is it? Uh, is it successful? Does it do what it's supposed to do? Yes, yes, yes. Um, actually, the here I'm sort of mixing 
antennas with reflectors okay. because um, this is actually a thing. This is like a, one of these USB Wi-Fi uh, things, uh, which by design has a limited range, but um, using sort of the, the, the curvature of this scoop, it um, focuses the radio waves. So instead of beaming it everywhere, it focuses to one point, which uh -huh. extends its range, basically. Uh -huh. It's like the way you can focus light. Uh, and uh, it does it beat the pen? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, different question. Uh, does the Pringles beat? No. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's talk about the Pringles one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, because I'm sure that's a very uh, popular one. It looks like anyone can do that. Yeah, actually, the more simple they get, the more popular they are. And the, the Pringles one is really sort of one that also kicked off this movement. Um, with uh, you know, with the beginning of the sort of Instructables magazine and the Meg magazine, w like the people were really fascinated w with, like, hey, within I don't know, 30 seconds, you can greatly improve your life. You know, like the sort of life hack mentality. Um, so this is actually one of the most famous and early examples of the of uh, antenna. But um, the way I've built it, it actually doesn't work. And um, I think that is, or I'm quite sure that is because it actually doesn't correspond to, to the size of the radio wave. Uh, okay, you have to explain that uh, yeah, to me yeah. at least. Uh, maybe there's well, a lot of experts like in the audience. But. Um, yeah, what I was explaining is that all these objects sort of um, have to work with this radio wave, um, w which is the, this 12.3 centimeters or like a fraction of that, so like half or a quarter. So these are like like six centimeters, three centimeters, these are all measurements that you will, uh, that, that repeat themselves in all these objects. Yeah. And that's also why sort of people are building these antennas because this 12 centimeters is uh, a size you f find in a lot of handheld objects, no? like it's, it's, it's our hand scale basically. Um, but this is seven centimeters, so it's, ah, it's okay, not half, okay. it's not full, so it, yeah. it doesn't really work actually. Okay, well, I, I don't think we have time to go through all of them, which I, I would love to, but we'll do that later. Um, um, but uh, So you've also been looking at the context in which these are used, right? And, and who actually makes which design. So what kind of relations that you find there between, oh, what kind of contexts are these actually created in? And then also, how does the context inform these designs? Um, yeah, well, mm, the context are basically also what, what these posters are, no? So you have like different kinds of attitudes toward it. So which one are they? Uh, uh, um, what are the contexts? The so so the, the radio amateurs who just, you know, they are fascinated by this. They, lo they love to work with this material. Um, the, the, the sort of life hack mentality, like ah, I'm going to improve my Wi-Fi. Then you have the, the people who really sort of want to build these alternative networks. Um, and then you have a more recent one, which I find really interesting, is the sort of internet freedom agenda, which is actually, um, yeah, it's, it's a bit this vague, broad idea that uh, through NGOs and through governmental help, you bring internet to people who don't have it. And through this, they can enlighten themselves and these kinds of things. And, and do these communities make different designs or are they largely the same? Um, well, in, in a way, they are the same because they have to no deal with this radio wave which has a specific shape uh, and size but um, for example like the, b the bottle which is between you and me uh, actually was designed by a French NGO which uh, got funding from the uh, American government uh, to bring internet to Mali and um, because in Mali you have all these like very remote villages and the internet only in the city so they would like beam the, the internet from the city to the villages. And uh, they did so with, with this antenna, which is basically the sort of local variant of these sort of can shape antennas. Yeah, and they gave the, they gave the NGO funding, not the people that actually had to use it. Obviously, oh. yeah, yeah. You can also see that in these pictures here, I have a lot of collected uh, images from these NGOs. And it's really funny that there's always one white person with a computer and a lot of black people around it just look at it, no? <laughs> okay. Um, um, uh, is, there an, uh, is there a question in the audience? Is, is this all clear? What, uh, yeah, over there. What, is, what, well, yeah, um, <laughs> what do you want to achieve? What do you want <coughs> to you achieve yourself? Uh, what, what is the ultimate, uh, the ultimate goal?
Yeah, a good question. So what is the higher aim of this project? Um, well, first for me, because I came from this position where I actually knew nothing about infrastructure, so that's also why I started building this, to sort of also get this sort of practical knowledge about it. No? Like I only realized this, this whole thing with the size of the wave and how this echoes in the objects um, through doing it. No? Like I just suddenly when you start building them, you, you see the same measurements everywhere all the time. Um, so this was really just a step to sort of explore the field, and but but now yeah I I'm, I'm really fascinated with this question like yeah what is the potential of of building your own uh, infrastructure no um, so I, I would like to continue uh, with that and also maybe try to uh, um, yeah to to set up an infrastructure as well. But if if I want to set up my own infrastructure, I have to admit I would walk to the media market and just get some stuff off the shelf. So what is the, what is the extra, uh, what is the added value of, of making these, uh, these utensils yourself in, in our context? Yeah, in, in, in the Dutch context, it's a bit difficult because what you see is like there are uh, some networks like this in uh, the Netherlands. There's a really big one in Leiden, which is called Wireless Leiden. And, and they don't use this anymore. They, they started off with this, but now they will use commercial products because it's all better and faster. No? Um, but at the same time, then I think it's it, it's also a shame to do that because you sort of m make another black box. You, know? you just put this weird little thing on the wall, and then it suddenly works, and that's it. Um, so in in doing this, you learn a lot about this infrastructure. Yeah. Okay, and uh, we need to we need to wrap up and continue to the next project. But um, uh, one of them actually also works, right? You connected one. Um, and uh, because I was, I was about to invite everyone to have a conversation with you about each and every one of these designs, but you actually uh, uploaded your uh, thesis on this, or the booklet you created on all these objects, uh, on one of these Wi-Fi's, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I, uh, the dish actually works, and it makes a hotspot that's called uh, Pretty Fly for a Wi-Fi. So, so get your iPhones out. <laughs> this is the test is lab it, moment. Is it visible? Yeah, okay. Are you connected? Did you, what happened? <laughs> Google doesn't work. You, 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 <laughs> you, you, should, you should try to, um, because it, it's not connected to the internet, it's, it's, yeah, it's a local hotspot, um, and you should try to type an address which you haven't typed before, because it, otherwise it will try to load the page from memory. Okay, so, so you connect to pr Pretty Fly for Wi-Fi. Yes. And you, then you open a page that you haven't opened before. Well, and then you open your browser and then just type uh, www.prettyflyforwifi.nl. Um, and you get your catalog. Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, still, if you don't want to go through all the effort, Roel will be here, uh, here to talk about all of these specific designs because I know, uh, uh, know your project a little bit, that behind every single uh, uh, design on this table. That's actually a really good story. So uh, please come back and visit Rule at this table. Uh, thank you, Rule, for your presentation. And it's time for us to uh, move into this corner here, the screen and the pictures. That's where we're moving to. And uh, as you can see, we're uh, surrounded by some other elements here, which are also part of the work. Uh, next to me is uh, Jairo Gutierrez Voigt. Do I somewhat am I somewhat close to the right pronunciation? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's yeah, yeah, yeah? it's okay. actually <laughs> like okay. Um, we're close to the to the to the uh, speaker here. Um, so uh, I've been asking some people also about their motivations on entering a program. You already had a master in visual arts from the University of Arts in Havana before you came to Cologne to join the Academy of Media Arts and, and have a media arts master there. So uh, before, before we uh, continue our conversation, what actually made you want to move from visual arts more deeply into media arts? In the time when I was in Havana developing the my last works, I had actually the chance to visit uh, Bonn, uh, and then I saw an exposition of the Media Art Academy of the of Cologne. And, uh, and uh, yeah, basically, uh, for me, was I saw that that academy was a chance for me to continue developing the work that I was making and making on other ones that it was like uh, the capabilities in comparison with, with Havana. In our school we had like really basic 
uh, equipment and possibilities. So Cologne was the chance to have a better equipment, professors, and get in touch also with the context. Okay, and um, um, uh, now moving to your work. Um, uh, well, may maybe you should start. Maybe, uh, what are we looking at here? Because there's a lot of uh, different elements. There's a screen, there's pho photos, there's, uh, there's some uh, screens here. What are we looking at? What, what use do, do these elements yeah. have? Well, the, the project basically is working with the idea of transport. Uh, those kind of blurs that we find like this, or like this, or like this, in Google Street View, I actually uh, searched it like everyone in Street View and uh, just crashed with that kind of images that are blur. And I ask myself, what is behind those houses, those people? What is important with them? And I mean, because in Cuba, we don't have it. We, we don't see it like this. So for me, as a new guy from outside, it was interesting to see what, is, what it's all about. And um, yeah, later on, uh, people told me about it, that privacy issues and how Google tried to solve it or deal with it. And at the same time, uh, which form became, and I mean, one of those, each of those blurs have a, a, a form, aesthetic form, and I was just, asking myself what about it, who make it, how does it function, and does it really function? And uh, yeah, basically I started that project face, uh, first with uh, installations uh, of those digital blurs in the, in the cities, in the same space, in the physical cities, later on with a performance and also with uh, Picture, digital pictures there. Yeah, no, here. So, so yeah. you, you uh, basically made a physical translation of these blurs that we know of Google Street View. Uh, but there's, there's two variations, right? One is an installation version that we see in the pictures over there. And then the other one is an, is an uh, intervention mm -hmm. or performative version mm -hmm. that we see in the video and, and on the right. Yeah. Um, and, and these elements around us? These elements are actually what I use, for example, in that performance, I use a similar box, let's say, to this. And these other elements here are the ones that uh, are prepared for an old performance. I have not still made it in the city. So basically, the performance functions uh, like, uh, like these installations. I found a place uh, where these blurs is. In the case of the performance, actually, I concentrated in people who are not uh, Blur only the face, that's the like, default option in, in Google, but like people who are almost completely blurred. And that happened because of two possibilities, an error, and because of the people ask for Google to raise the whole figure in the image. But I guess uh, with these uh, things that you created, we don't have to ask Google anymore, right? Is that the idea? Um, the idea is always to... Um, confront uh, the digital aspect with the physical one. So for this, for this also, uh, there is a place in Cologne where there are four different persons meeting at a point just crossing a street. And in the image is created very uh, strange, looks like, looks like prepared, but actually, you know that is something that happened casually. So four different persons meeting at a point just waiting for the traffic light to change and they are all completely blurry. So the idea is just to reconstruct it, like to find for probably with friends or some people, say everyone come from different positions, meet at a point, and just walk away in the street, and like that performance just happen in a moment and disappear in the city. Uh, but uh, and, and the performance we see right here is that you in that box? I, that was that's just very close to my house. Okay. okay. Yeah. And and what was your experience actually being in the box? Like because I think people want themselves blurred because they don't want people to see them, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're wearing this box, you actually get a lot of attention, I presume. Well, actually, I see that over there. You see everyone yeah. everyone looking at you. So in that sense, it's not very effective. No. Yeah, th I think that uh, the performance as well as the installation also uh, dialogue about the double property that those that the blurs in Google Street View has. Uh, I mean, the blurs in Google Street View follow the objectives to hide something, but at the same time, they are remarking that it's something there that wants to be high. So for this structure, it's also the same. What will happen? At, at the beginning of this process, I asked myself, and uh, what will happen if, if uh, all those blurred images will become like suddenly real, will become suddenly physical? What, how, what the cities will look like, or what you know the, the countries will look like everywhere when only blurred buildings, blurred people will be like in the in the streets? So it's all about it. What what makes what transformation made in our culture in us, 
this digital image of, of, of our cities, of our physical space, of our people. Okay. I, are there any questions in the audience right now? No? Um, well, something I'm, I'm wondering about is uh, you've, you've done a lot of actually background research before you produced uh, these works uh, uh, and uh, produced a whole thesis around it. Um, but diving into it that deeply, uh, what is your position in this whole privacy discussion? Like, do you, do, you, do you think people should have the right to be private in the virtual domain? And this is also literally a proposal to have that same right in the physical domain. I think I am in the double, like in the double side. I'm, at some point, I found, of course, a right that the people should decide if they want to be seen or not. And at the same time, I found uh, ridiculous, and that was for me the starting point. This project because <coughs> you could actually walk in front of the house, you could actually see people in the streets. So why really the need to to ask for Google to blur the image? And I mean, later on, I, when I, I realized what what is it, but uh, still. It's still this, this double, this double, uh, yeah, this contradiction, no? In yeah. one size. So, so basically, basically uh, the, the question you're raising is, uh, do we really need this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And do we? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm actually, not, I, 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 th I think we should leave that for everyone uh, here to uh, find out, because uh, the idea is that we can actually take these uh, installations outside, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, just use it and, and test it in the street outside. Yeah, okay. Can you demonstrate it for us? Like, uh, uh, like, like for this one, you could just use it like this, just walk around with it. Also for, for, for all the other ones. Um, for the big one, the box, it's a little bit more complicated. You just have to get inside from under it. And there is a belt, a climbing belt, actually. Uh -huh. You put it on you, and you, you just grab some, some strings that are inside, and then you can walk away with it. You just have to take care of people and a little bit of the wind. I see some very exciting faces in the audience. Uh, uh, they're invited to try it out later, right? Uh, I think I think this one needs a little bit of help uh, yes. from you to yes. install. But uh, who, who's going who's gonna to be the first one? <laughs> no, no, really? You look so enthusiastic before. Yeah. Okay, okay, then I'll do it. I'll be the first one to walk around with it. Okay. And uh, but someone, please uh, also um, make uh, make a film like that for me because I want to see people's responses to it. <laughs> um, I think we should just leave it at that and have people experience it for themselves. Uh, thank you, Gyro, for the for the presentation. An applause, please. Hey, um, but before I uh, dive into that box, uh, I would like to uh, do a few uh, closing announcements. Uh, I hope you had a, a first uh, good introduction to these projects, to the people behind these projects. Uh, the idea is that you don't run off now, but that you actually come in and continue this conversation with all the artists here and have a closer look at these works. There's a few things for you to try out, of course. Uh, uh, the cocktail bar at Veronica uh, will be open soon. Uh, Veronica, cocktails in two minutes? Yeah? Okay, so cocktails in two minutes. Uh, there's screens for you to take out. I'm going to take the big box. Uh, there's uh, some stuff to be download over, uh, downloaded over DIY Wi-Fi. Uh, Peter is going to perform for us in five minutes from now. Uh, and of course, uh, Mohammed and Catherine's uh, speculative projects are here. And Lasse, Lasse can tell you, tell you a lot more about all these specific presents. So please come back and revisit uh, all of these projects. Uh, I also hope that uh, all of you also picked up on a few general tendencies in this new generation of artists and designers, because that's eventually what we're here for, to sort of see what all these new young talents bring to our field, what kind of new methodologies, what new themes, what new questions. Um, so I also hope you, you're looking at that uh, uh, tonight. Um, in any case, uh, I see plenty of talent coming in, and also ambitions are very high, which I think is really good uh, to see in tonight's program. Um, I would like to close with a few thank yous. Uh, first of all, to all the people uh, that participated in tonight's program. Uh, Mohamed Ali, Roel Roskam Abing, uh, Jairo Gutierrez, Catherine Fleming, Veronica Kren, Lasse van der Bosch Christensen, Peter Edwards. All of you, thank you very much for your presentation, but also for helping uh, building this up tonight. Uh, a big applause for our presenters, please. Um, Tonight would not, would not have been possible with all, uh, without all these recommendations from teachers and teaching coordinators across Europe, uh, but also not without uh, the, the hard work of all these 
people here at V2. Uh, I would like to especially thank Wilco, Richard, Alex Falk, Anna Mercedes, Elise and Jeroen that uh, made a direct contribution, but there's many more people behind the scenes working on these uh, programs. Also a big round of applause to them. Um, if you enjoyed tonight so far, uh, please note down that se September 11th, uh, Test Lab is back with uh, presentations of our summer residency program. Uh, if you want to receive updates on that, the best thing to do is actually to put your email address on this list here on the bar and then you're automatically subscribed to our monthly newsletter and you get all the updates on what, what is happening when here at V2. Um, I would like to also thank you for coming over. In five minutes, Peter will start to play. Uh, maybe have a quick refreshment here at the bar and then we'll gather around Peter for his performance. Thank you very much. And then if you want, you can return. But how do I, I call into you? You can into where? Or is it just around my middle? Exactly. Yeah? Oh, okay. Yo, so you don't have to use it with the legs or something like this. Okay. No? And then <laughs> later. <laughs> side of this thing. actually have here uh, attached to your yeah, yeah, yeah. you can actually then grab just the ropes. grab the ropes and just stand up yeah any cars come